Hello, I'm Mark Thorsby. This is a history of ancient philosophy. In this video today, we'll be looking at Plato's Republic. In particular, we'll be looking at books one and two of Plato's Republic. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I apologize. Normally, I always have a video where I'm recording my own image along with the, um, the presentation. So, but today I'm not doing that, so my apologies. Um, I don't have my cameras not working, so I'm just recording it, um, just what you see on the screen. So, I hope this works all right. Um, so, welcome aboard, everyone. So, we're going to be looking at Plato's Republic. And um, over the past couple of uh, lessons here, we've been looking at Plato's work from the Apology to the Gorgias, where we looked at the differentiation between rhetoric and reason, or logos and rhetoric. Um, and then we have also looked at the Phaedo last week, um, where in the, uh, not the Phaedo, I'm sorry, we looked at the Mino, in which we looked at the question of what is virtue and how does virtue come to be, um, and where do you get it? And we got the we, we started to look at Plato's theory of recollection. That's his epistemological view. <clears throat> well, today we're going to be looking at the Republic. And the Republic is Plato's probably most mature, um, comprehensive vision of the theory of the forms. Um, now we're not going to talk about the theory of the forms today because we're going to be we're only going to be looking at books one and two. That's the first two books of ten books within the Republic. So what I want to do is let me begin by giving you a sort of a rough, a real quick overview of what the Republic's all about. The sort of Republic has different sections in it, three primary sections, but it has a prologue, an introduction, a conclusion and an epilogue as well. So in the prologue here, um, you know, what I wanted to do here is give you sort of an analytic outline. So you can see here are the Stephanus numbers, and then here's generally what's happening. So from 327A to 328B, the dialogue opens up, and we actually have Socrates um, making the descent to Piraeus, um, where um, he um, had gone to a... Um, uh, a f festival, a religious festival, and he's actually on his way back. Now, he's with a couple different people, and he has a conversations with a couple different people. First off, he has a he has a discussion with Cephalus, um, who's a, a fairly old man um, who's lived a good life, um, and this gets sparking up the question of what does it mean to as we get older, um, what does it mean to have a good life, and one of Cephalus's answers is that justice. Um, we can see then the conversation in the prologue switches to Paul and Marcus, who then talks about justice from his perspective. And then finally we have Thrasymachus, who is a sophist, and he'll argue that justice is just simply the advantage of the stronger. And so all of this is taking place in book one. Um, and then we have what we might call the introduction, or the, the actual question of whether or not justice is better than injustice gets addressed. Now, once that's the case, the Republic starts getting going in full swing, in full force. And the first sort of thing that gets happening here is we'll see that, in, and by the end of today's video, we'll have talked about all of this stuff mainly. Um, we won't get to justice in the polis, but we will take a look at the genesis of the polis and where the polis comes from and why we have a city-state and why we have government and why we need a Republic. Uh, we'll look at... Um, Plato's division of labor, in which he'll talk about there's an artisan class, but there's also the guardian class, and he'll talk about the education of the guardians, the constitution of the polis, what justice means in the polis. And remember here, if you're not familiar with it, polis is the word for city-state. It's where we, of course, get the term political from. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So once, once in the Republic, now remember we're just giving you an outline of the entire dialogue. Once Plato um, talks about what justice looks like in the polis, he then extrapolates it and tries to see how the embodiment of the idea would work. Um, and so we have a number of different things, including looking at um, the, the somatic unit of the polis and the Hellens. Um, he will also take a look at the rule of philosophers. This is famously Plato talks about the idea that you have a philosopher king, and what he's going to argue for is the idea that we need a guardian class to protect the society, but the very best of the guardians we need as rulers. Now, 
these guardians, the very best guardian, should exhibit the qualities of a philosopher. Um, and then he'll talk about the idea of the agathon, uh, the education of the philosophers. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this more later. Part three of the Republic is when he talks about the decline of the polis. And we see a number of key things where Plato discusses um, these four different types of government, democracy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. Um, and we'll talk about what he what he has to say about those. He's actually fairly um, critical of democracy, in fact. Um, so we'll, we'll cover that in uh, not this video, but the next video. Finally, we'll get a conclusion at the end of the dialogue here. Uh, and it, you know, this is in book 10 or so that justice is better than injustice. And then in the epilogue, we get actually an interesting discussion here of where Plato actually rejects the use of art, um, mimetic art. Mimesis, the mimetic comes from the Greek term mimesis, and mimesis refers to the idea of being able to duplicate or copy something. And one of Plato's concerns here is going to be that our goal should be um, enlightenment through a contemplation of the forms not a contemplation of a, a mimesis of the forms and so Plato's going to reject the use of art in society actually and he's actually going to uh, fairly limit the role that art plays within his Republic um, he also talked about the immortality of the soul uh, a previous question we've looked at as well as look at the rewards of justice in life and then the judgment of the dead. And all of this takes place in 10 books. And that's sort of a, a general outline, uh, a general analytic outline of Plato's Republic. So there's really, really a lot more to say about the Republic. It's a very rich text. Here's a part, the Parthenon. I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, it's a very, very rich text, and there's a lot of key issues. Unfortunately, in this video, I don't have time to cover all of those issues, so I'm just going to cover what I think is critical, but I, I want you to know that as you're reading this text, you're going to discover um, different insights um, that, um, <clears throat> that maybe I don't talk about. So there's a lot here, uh, and there's just no way we can cover it all in a, in a sort of hour-long video here. So let's sort of start off with book one. Um, book one is where we see the question of justice emerge. And what we can say here is that is that the Republic uses the question of justice, that is, what is justice, and is justice better than injustice? The Republic uses this question to really open up a whole range of philosophical questions. So we're going to see that even though the, it begins with the question of justice, um, Plato is essentially going to argue, well, in order to understand what justice is, we have to understand what the soul is. We have to also understand how it is possible that we can come to knowledge. We have to understand what virtue is, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, sort of Plato, I sort of see it as like a crowbar question, that's sort of odd sounding, but it's like he uses this question, what is justice, but with as a crowbar, and sort of pops open on an entire safe, uh, a vault of new questions and so it's really exciting dialogue um, and really the truth is that if anyone if you want to consider yourself educated you really have to have read this text um, it's had such an impact on our society uh, but it also the questions it raises are extraordinarily pertinent the question of justice I think is a question that's really quite critical for us to be thinking about still today in the 20th century, especially when you consider um, things that are going on in our society. Um, and for instance, the massive incarceration um, of, of black men all over the United States. You can look at that issue. Um, you can look at a whole range of different issues of justice and ask yourselves, well, what is justice? And is justice something that's actually possible for us? Can we actually achieve justice? So, okay, let me start off with sort of uh, the beginning here of book one and give you a sense of the setting. Now, we don't believe that the, the Republic ever took place. Um, now, um, so this is, a, a, again, one of Plato's more mature works. And here Socrates, who is the primary character, 
does not proclaim the typical sort of ignorance that we see taught Socrates normally doing. Socrates actually is the one who makes all the arguments in this dialogue, or at least a lot of them. And um, though we will see there's back and forth, there's a lot of different things going on. Um, so it's not historically accurate, um, but it, he uses key characters uh, that his audience would have known um, from Athens history. Or, uh, and some of these people were real people, though. For instance, like Glaucon was a real person. Uh, Adamantius, Thras Thrasymachus, all of these people were real people. But we believe that Plato is organizing this dialogue accordingly. Now, one of the things that's interesting is, even though we consider this one today one of Plato's ma more mature works, the authenticity of this text has been called into question on previous occasion. Uh, for instance, Proclus argues that Plato was not the author of the Republic, and that the Republic was actually written by a combination of authors uh, from later philosophers who lived uh, and, and taught at, in, in the academy, that's Plato's school, but after his death. So typically scholars don't really argue this any longer, uh, but it's worth putting out there that um, throughout history actually, since th these texts are so ancient, uh, throughout history there's been sort of a whole variety of different interpretations of these texts. Um, so. Uh, we're not going to get into too much of that nitty-gritty interpretation business. I would just sort of take a look at the general gist um, of what Plato is arguing. So what's the setting? As we mentioned before, it's actually taking out this dialogue actually takes place outside of Athens. They're actually the dialogue begins and they're walking home. We're, at, we're told at the beginning of 327, that's the very beginning of the dialogue. Socrates is saying, he says, I went down to Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, the son of Ariston. I wanted to say prayers to the goddess, and I was also curious um, to see how they would manage the festival since they were holding it for the first time. I thought the procession of the local residents was a fine one, and that the one conducted by the Thracians was no less outstanding. After we'd said our prayers and, and seen the procession, we started back towards Athens. Polemarchus saw us from a distance as we were setting off for home and told his slave to run and ask us to wait for him. Now we'll see that Polemarchus is actually an older, <coughs> he's more of a senior Athenian gentleman. Um, so uh, the slave caught hold of my cloak and from behind, Polemarchus wants you to wait, he said. I turned around and asked where Polemarchus was. He said he's coming up right behind you. Please wait for him. And Glaucon replied, all right, we will. So um, he says, and just then Paul Marcus caught up with us. Adamantius, Glaucon's brother, was with him, and so were Necritaeus, the son of Nicias, and some others, all of whom were apparently on their way from the procession. Okay, so Paul Marcus said, it looks to me, Sargus, as if you're starting off for Athens. Okay, so that's how the dialogue begins. The setting is that they've just left a um, a religious festival, and they're headed back to Athens by road, um, by dirt road, and they're walking. So not really going to be walking too far, but they are outside of Athens, and it's notable that they're now starting off for Athens. So, um, so that's how the dialogue sort of opens up. Um, the context here is Socrates is well known, um, and that's why people want to walk with him, like Polemarchus. And we'll see there's a variety of different characters. Actually, the two key characters in this dialogue, though, they're all in there, really. They're going to actually be Thrasymachus and Socrates, okay? So, one of the things we'll see, and what I want to do here is, there's so much I could talk about in this dialogue, but um, what I want to do is sort of bring up a couple of different points that seem to emerge. One of the, the, di the difficulties we see right off in the dialogue here is what I want to call the difficulty of conversation. Um, and it concerns the issue that we've looked at before between rhetoric and logos. And it also concerns Plato's conception of the dialectic. One of the things we'll see, and we'll talk about this in a lot more depth um, in our next video when we look at sort of the other parts of the Republic, is that Plato is using a dialectic method because he thinks, he's going to argue, that the dialectic method is the primary philosophical method and the highest form of reasoning. And the dialectic method 
consist essentially in the Socratic style of exchange we've been looking at. But importantly, the dialectic method is one in which, um, as people discuss things, both people are in a state of ignorance, but they, or at least they both have views, but that over time those views synthesize into a new view. So dialectic um, form of dialogue is one in which we'll see that Socrates doesn't know the answer to the question of what is justice, and it's about moving from not knowing to knowing. So that's sort of what the dialectic looks like. When we look at the divided line in Plato's Allegory of the Cave next time, um, we'll talk about the dialectic again. So part of the difficulty of conversation here is the idea that it's how does one discuss something that one doesn't know about, right? How do, how do you discuss something that you're ignorant of? Um, and so that's an interesting question. But we also see there's a difficulty of conversation in terms of rhetoric. And this is primarily concerns the debate and the distinction between Thrasymachus and Socrates. Um, we'll see that Socrates, in, in book one, the, the exchange between Thrasymachus and Socrates is primarily an ex a debating sort of exchange in which so we see Socrates the way we typically see him, in which he's questioning, um, he's analyzing, and um, he's leading Thrasymachus down an argument that ultimately dislodges Thrasymachus' own view about justice. And we'll see too that Thrasymachus, he's a really sort of nasty fellow. Um, and I say nasty is by the end of the dialogue, as he gets sort of, as Socrates sort of comes in for the kill, Thrasymachus gets increasingly sort of uh, mean, uh, and, he, and he makes lots of mean comments to Socrates. Uh, so he's not a very good sport. Everyone else in the dialogue is primarily a friend of Socrates, and um, we'll see that Thrasymachus, he sort of drops out after book one, though he still is there to some degree. Um, so there's a difficulty of conversation here in which you can tell in book one that Socrates is interested in answering the question and Thrasymachus is more interested in presenting a perspective and winning an argument. Um, and we'll see though, that the, at least in what I want to cover in this video, that Thrasymachus ultimately does himself in, I think, um, and he makes contradictory claims, and that may, that, so it's sort of interesting, okay? So the sort of difficulty of conversation here is how does one break into understanding the essence of something that they're ignorant of, and how does one do it authentically in logos rather than merely as a form of present, uh, rhetorical presentation, okay? So that's the first sort of thing. Now, We'll see, though, that, and I, I didn't put it in here, but the way the sort of dialogue begins is they have a discussion with Paul Marcus and Cephalus, and uh, as I mentioned, Paul Marcus is an older gentleman, and they begin to talk to Paul Marcus and ask him what he thinks is good in life and, and um, what's led him to do so well, and he's also wealthy, and so the question gets, gets um, arisen, well, how much does, was money important for your development? And how, how important was money for living the good life? And we'll see that the money gets played down. Um, so money doesn't take a big role in the dialogue, dialectical exchange here. But we'll see that one of the things the poly market says is he says, well, I've, I've lived justly because I wanted to, I didn't want to be punished in the afterlife. Um, and so there's a question here of, the, a whole religious sort of vein of questions gets arisen. And then the question is, well, what are you worried about in the afterlife? He says, well, I want to be judged as a just person in the afterlife. And then the question, of course, arises, well, what is justice? And and um, this sort of, there's this exchange in the beginning between Paul and Marcus, Socrates, Cephalus and Socrates, as they sort of go through and lay this out. Um, and Cephalus gives... Um, his answer to these questions as well. And they sort of, Paul Marcus and Cephalus trade off. Um, but pretty quickly, um, actually here, um, and it's a re right around, let's see here, around 333 that we see Socrates uh, and Cephalus talking about money. Um, but then there's references to Homer um, by 334. 
Um, and then we can see we start to build up this question: What is justice? Thrasymachus, who's a sophist, he jumps into the he jumps into the dialogue here, and he takes up the challenge, um, as the sophists are likely to do. And Thrasymachus defines justice as that as that which is advantageous to the stronger. So he says that justice is when the stronger uh, person gets what the uh, gets what they want essentially, right? Um, justice is the advantage of the stronger. Now he says that each polis, so each of the city-states within the, the greater Greek world, has set up different laws in regard to their own power system. So, for instance, in tyrannies we see tyrannical laws set up. In, dem in democracies we see democratic laws. In oligarchies we see oligarchic laws and so on and so forth. And what Thrasymachus is arguing is that if you go to any of these city-states, it looks like the laws that are set up, and after all, the laws embody justice, right? Each of the laws are different, and they're set up to protect those in power. Which certainly is was probably the case to a certain degree. And certainly we can say that it looks like many times there are laws in our own society that are set up for specific people rather than for the benefit of the majority. So Thrasymachus argues that when you take a look at government, when you look at these poli, <coughs> excuse me, when you take a look at government in these poli, what you'll see is that justice is a relative concept. And you can see here this notion of um, the man is the measure of all things we talked about with, regarding Protagoras in the earlier service. That's a strong element of what Thrasymachus is arguing here, right? It's the idea that these city-states are relative to each other, they have different laws, and those laws seem to be set up for the advantage of the stronger. So what is justice? Well, justice here isn't something real, it's not something to aspire to, right? Justice, rather, is simply and nothing more than the ability of the stronger to establish their own laws, right? And to get their way, essentially. So it's the advantage of the stronger. Now you can you can obviously see right away that this is a, a cynical view regarding justice, right? This is a cynic's view, and why do I say a cynical view? Well, justice at the very core of our conception of justice is a sense of impartiality, and the idea that justice is the same for all. Uh, but you can see here that Thrasymachus's argument is that that's precisely not the case. Justice isn't for the advantage of the, of all. Justice is for, for the advantage of the few. Um, and justice is, is actually partial rather than impartial. So this sets a pretty big gauntlet for Socrates, I think. Um, it's a pretty skeptical and cynical position, I think. Now, Socrates makes the distinction between understanding the truth, that is, to understand is not to know the truth, right? Um, so Socrates makes the distinction between um, having the truth and understanding it. And understanding it, um, begins with the idea that you don't know what it is, hence you have to understand it. And what what Plato's doing here is, I think Plato is establishing sort of small epistemological and method methodological points for us to take note of. Now, Socrates, of course, is going to rebut Thrasymachus. He doesn't know what justice is, but he's certainly against the idea that justice is just the advantage of the stronger, and it's relative to whoever rules at any one time. And so what is Socrates going to argue? Well, what I've done here is I've tried to give you a sort of general outline of his argument. Of course, it takes place over a couple different pages, right? But what he's going to argue is he's going to say, okay, well, just laws are the laws that are, are advantageous, right? Um, this is Thrasymachus' view here. So that means that all laws that are set up by rulers are set up so as the, to be advantageous, right? And Thrasymachus is going to agree to this, right? Because his whole idea is, yeah, that is right. Uh, the ruler figures out what laws are advantageous, they set them up, right? So that's all that just laws are. And that also means that because it's a relative conception, that all of the laws established by the rulers will always, are simply, the, or let, let me put it this way, all, of, all the laws that are just are just only because they've been created by the ruler. Right, which means that justice is contingent upon the rulers. But here's the problem. 
rulers can be fallible, right? There are some rulers that make mistakes, right? And this leads Thrasymachus into a sort of vice of a contradiction. Because Thrasymachus is going to argue that, yes, justice um, is nothing more than the advantage of the stronger, and justice is, is some, the laws are written by the stronger, but the problem here, as Socrates raises, is that Thrasymachus is going to agree that yes, rulers can make mistakes, there is fallibility, but guess what? That means that some of the laws are actually disadvantaged, disadvantageous to the rulers, because if the ruler makes a mistake, it might be the case that a law gets through that's actually to their disadvantage, which means that there are some laws that are just, there are some quote-unquote just laws that are both advantageous and disadvantageous to the ruler. Now, you can see here that what Socrates is saying is that if Thrasymachus is right, if justice is relative to the stronger, then that means that it's contingent and it seems to change all the time. And so, because people are fallible, that means that what Thrasymachus is calling a just law would be just and unjust at the same time or potentially um, you can see that the his argument here that the laws are simply the advantage to, to the advantage of the stronger begins to degrade and it begins to decay. It's sort of interesting. You might call it a decaying thesis here, uh, because what happens is the thesis gets revised again, right? So we see um, Clytophon jumping in here um, at 340b, and and he wants he begins to revise the thesis and he says he meant that the advantage of the stronger. Whoops, I see there's a mistakes here in the spelling, my apologies. He says that he meant that the advantage of the stronger is what the stronger believes is advantageous to himself. And so here we get the idea that uh, uh, Clytophon adds, so let's go back here, right, that, um, that what is advantageous is directly dependent upon the ruler, right? And so it depends upon what the ruler recognizes as to his or her advantage. Now, it's interesting here that Thrasymachus at 340 accuses Socrates of lying and of being, uh, uh, of, being uh, uh, of misrepresentation. As we saw in a previous dialogue, Socrates was frequently accused of making the stronger argument weak and the weaker argument stronger. Um, and that's simply because uh, the stronger argument here from Thrasymachus's view is that the justice is the advantage of the stronger, but we'll see that once again Socrates pokes holes in this idea, and he'll also attack this revised thesis that we saw. That well, it has to do with what the ruler can recognize as to their own advantage, and that would sort of clear up some of the problem. Well, Socrates is like in most dialogues, he likes to give analogical examples and take analogies, and so he says, let's take the analogy analogy or the analog of a doctor, a physician. A doctor is a healer of the sick, right? And then we can also take another example, a helmsman, right? A helmsman is the ruler of a sailor, right? That's the person who's barking orders at the ship, you know, the, I always imagine, and I'm not a sailor, so for those of you watching who are sailors, you know, I, I my hat's off to you. Um, but the helmsman is the, the sort of person behind um, the wheel of the ship, the, the, um, guiding the ship, right? And they're guiding the rulers. In each case, they are both experts, right? And each is an expert at an art. And here the term art is meant much looser than we're accustomed to. You might say that each is an expert in their craft, right? That is, the helmsman is an expert in sailing, and a doctor is an expert in health, right? The health of individuals, right? So every, so this is what an art is. So every art is insufficient in itself and it always requires a further virtue or object, right? So that is, uh, what does this mean at, point, at D here? It's the idea that every art has an object towards which it's organized, right? So the physician's object is who? The patient, right? The physician is primarily concerned with the body of the patient. Um, what is the object of the helmsman? Well, the object of the helmsman is the ship sailing, right? Um, and so the idea here is that every art has its own telos, if you will, its own sort of goal or purpose that it's directed towards. 
but <coughs> each art considers what's advantage what is advantageous to its subject so in the medical art it's concerned with the body but it's not concerned with art itself right it's not concerned with the art itself it's concerned with the body of the patient and the helmsman's done what is best for the sailors not a single sailor right so each artist considers what's advantageous to its subject rather than what is advantageous to the practitioner right so therefore a ruler will command what is advantageous to the ruled not the ruler right because he wants to say argue by analogy that a doctor what's advantageous for a doctor to do is not necessarily what is advantageous to the doctor herself right the, the, the work of a doctor should be organized around the needs of the patient. The work of the sailor isn't to do what's in their own interest, but to do what is in the interest of all the sailors, what's in the interest of the ship as a whole. right? So if that's the case, and you could see you could extrapolate it here even further, right? you could take any craft, any art, as Plato puts it, and have the same argument. right? So you could take, for instance, um, take a chef, Right, a person who, who cooks food, gourmet food, let's say, um, for other people. Uh, what a good chef does what's advantageous to the their to the restaurant um, uh, goers, right? To the person who goes to the restaurant, they're concerned with their customer, not necessarily with the way the food tastes to themselves. So, in the same way, you could say that a ruler com should command what is advantageous to the ruled not the ruler. Uh, and this begins to break down the Thrasymachus' argument that it's just about the advantage, the advantage of the stronger, and in particular the advantage of whoever the, the ruler is. So what we get here is that at 347b, we get this interesting, towards the end of the, the dialogue here in, in Book 1, we see Plato suggesting that, look, look, the just do not desire wages or honor, because they seek the advantage of their object, the ruled, and not themselves. But the just rule out of necessity, lest they be ruled by the unjust. So we, at 347, we see an interesting clue that will um, help us um, look at the rest of the Republic, which is the idea that the just rule, a, a just ruler, rules A in order to um, have the advantage of justice for the people, Right, for those who are ruled, but B, the person who rules who's just doesn't really want to do it. Right? They, they rule because they have to. They rule out of necessity um, because they're not interested in gaining things for themselves. Rather, they're interested in gaining the advantage of their object. Right? Justice for a just society. Right? So if a society of just men ever existed, um, Socrates says, they would likely fight over not being the ruler, just as we seem to fight over being the ruler. So, you can see here that by the end of the dialogue, Socrates sort of turns the tables here, um, and raises this, uh, and also raises a pointed criticism of the politics of his own day. Namely, that in the politics of his own day, people were fighting over being rulers, rather than not being rulers, which demonstrates that they're more interested in their own advantage than they are the advantage of others. Um, so, and it's interesting here because I think that Plato is probably also making um, subtle comments politically um, to the Athenians in this text, and he's, and he's talking about some of this stuff. So what are some of the thoughts and observations that sort of pop out to me when I look at this first book? And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I really feel like I'm doing the book injustice here because I'm going through it so quickly. Um, there really is a lot of rich stuff in here. But what we can see here is that the role of the philosopher begins to emerge here. Um, and we're going to see that the philosopher is, is similar. Um, well, the role of the philosopher emerges here in the sense that we can see that in the same sense that Socrates is arguing that the philo the uh, the good ruler doesn't want to rule, he's ultimately going to identify the, a good ruler, a just ruler, as someone who has a philosophic spirit, or someone who's a philosopher of some sort. And by philosopher, we don't mean a person who sits and teaches classes about 
reality and epistemology. What we mean is a person who who um, who loves wisdom and tries to act wisely. In this first dialogue, we also see the method of the dialectic at play, in which we see a dialogue where the, our characters begin the dialogue in a state of ignorance. They don't know what justice is. And by the end of book one, they haven't gained insight into what justice is per se, or not fully. They, they begin to sort of dance around the edges of what justice is. But what we do see is that they're able to eliminate one of the possibilities for what justice is, and that is they eliminate this relativistic argument by Thrasymachus that justice is the advantage of the stronger. So you have a dialectic movement where at the beginning of book one, we don't have knowledge, but and by the end of book one, we have, we have more knowledge, though not complete knowledge. Um, and we can see here that there's a difference between the object of philosophy and the object of sophistry. Um, really embodied by philosophy, the object of philosophy is embodied by Socrates, where Socrates wants to actually gain knowledge, and the object of sophistry is embodied by Thrasymachus, and he doesn't really care, it seems, so much about figuring out what justice is, because after all, he doesn't think he's ignorant, he thinks he does know what justice is. Uh, but we see that his argument fails, because it's inconsistent with all the other things he wants to argue about justice. And so it looks like the object of sophistry is power, that is, winning the argument. Um, and, and you can see by the way that Plato paints the portrait of Thrasymachus as really sort of a nasty fellow, right? So for instance, at 338d, um, Thrasymachus says, You disgust me, Socrates. Socrates, your trick is to take hold of an argument at the point where you can do it the most harm, right? So it's interesting here because Thrasymachus is arguing that Socrates is taking parts of the argument that can cause harm and it's disgusting and it gets really sort of nasty. Um, so we see a differentiation between philosophy and sophistry here. And this is typical of the other dialogues we've looked at, but we'll see pretty quickly here that the Republic leaves the, the, the debate um, with the sophist behind. Um, and then begins to develop a more positive argument in book two regarding what justice is. Now, what happens in book book one really ends in a sort of stalemate where the question of what justice is is raised, um, but it's not at all together clear um, what the answer is. In fact, let me go ahead and read you. Let me go back here. I want to read you briefly the very last paragraph in book one. Um, that's where Socrates is arguing this this is um, 354b roughly and this is Socrates saying he says given by you Thrasymachus after you became gentle and ceased to give me rough treatment yet I haven't had a fine banquet but that's my fault not yours I seem to have behaved like a glutton snatching at every dish and passing and tasting it before properly saving its predecessor Right, so Socrates is sort of commenting, this is sort of a comment about the dialectic here, where in the dialogue here, Socrates is constantly sort of jumping ahead to try to get at justice. He says, before finding the answer to our first inquiry about what justice is, I let that go and turned to investigate whether it was a kind of vice and ignorance or a kind of wisdom and virtue. Then an argument came up about injustice being more profitable than justice, and I couldn't refrain from abandoning the previous one and following up on that. Hence the result of the discussions, as far as I'm concerned, is that I know nothing. And when I don't know what justice is, I'll hardly know whether it is a kind of virtue or not, or whether a person who has it is happy or unhappy. So book one ends in a typical Socratic state of ignorance. We don't really have the answer to the question. But you can see here that we at least know what's not the answer. And I didn't really mention it, uh, but this argument, and you can see Socrates referencing it here, but in book one, um, the argument about justice being the advantage of the stronger eventually morphs into a question about uh, whether or not injustice is better than justice. And here we say that what, uh, because sometimes what looks unjust is actually to our advantage, right? So that's where that, that discussion comes from in book one. Uh, but they break that argument down for the same reasons we looked at. So what we're going to see in book two, though, is this is sort of a little bit later. Um, 
um, essentially, um, Thrasymachus ab abandons the argument in the beginning of book two. But Glaucon, right, he essentially jumps into the, the debate and asks some really key questions that reanimates the entire debate. Um, and he's going to basically say, take up Thrasymachus' argument. Now, it's notable here that Glaucon is actually one of Socrates' companions here. So Glaucon is going to play the role of the sophist in order to see if he can prompt Socrates to actually give a fuller account of what justice is. And um, so he sort of jumps in here, right? Um, Glaucon sort of takes up um, this problem, and then he's going to force Socrates to answer. So, really, beginning of book two, we begin to see Socrates' positive argument regarding, or his positive account regarding what justice is. Now, in th at 357b, right at the beginning of book two, we see a distinction between, uh, we ask the question, okay, well, what is the, what, are, what does justice give us? Are there non-consequentialist goods? That is, are there certain things that are good that justice provides that it don't have to do with the consequences that it provides? For instance, when I create a just law, maybe my just law is that you can't steal from other people, right? A consequence of that of that law is that it is that people don't steal from each other. That's what we might say is a consequentialist good of justice. Here the question is, are there non-consequentialist goods? That is, are there some things that we desire for their own sake? Right? He says, are there things that we desire not for their consequences, but for their own sakes? Because it looks like there's three types of goods in which it's possible. We can have, we can have some goods that are good because of their consequences. This is what we might call a consequential good. There are some things that are good because we desire them for their own sake, not because they not because they create good consequences. And finally, there's some things that, that are good for their own sake, but they also bear consequences. Now, which one of these do you think justice will be? I put up there what Socrates thinks. Uh, and, of course, you're not surprised to see that he thinks that justice is the third kind. Justice is something that's good intrinsically, but it also is good consequentially. So, this is an important sort of language element here that we have to mention is that um, the difference between consequentialist goods and, intr and intrinsic goods. Something is intrinsically good if it's good in and of itself, and something is consequentially good if it leads to good results. Now, for instance, let me see if I can give an example for all of these. A co for instance, take um, war. In warfare, you drop bombs on, on factories and you kill people. That's not good in, its, in and of itself, but it can be consequentially good. That is, by destroying the factory, you destroy your enemy's military capacity and thereby, you know, create a better situation. So that would be consequentially good. Something that's good in and of itself would be like happiness. We all desire it, not because happiness gets us anything, but because happiness is the, is the final end state towards which that we're after. And it looks like justice is this third kind where it's something that we want for its own sake, but justice is also good consequentially. So he says that this means that justice is the most beautiful kind of good because it's beautiful in all of its ways. And here you can contrast the idea that in the ancient Greek world, beauty was conceived along the lines of symmetry. And so there's a nice symmetry here. So Glaucon then, of course, says, okay, so if that's what justice is, then what I want, Socrates, is I want you to give me a demonstration of justice. I want to know what justice really is. I and mean, I want you to demonstrate it. And Socrates is sort of like, well, what exactly does that mean? And this is where Glaucon reanimates the Thrasymachus' argument, the uh, Th Thrasymachian argument, by going a step further than actually Thrasymachus did and asking why exactly justice is better than injustice. And this is an interesting question. Because it looks like maybe being unjust can actually be to your greater advantage. And I gave you an example here, and there's lots of different examples, so I'm not trying to pick on anyone. Uh, I know that some people feel like sometimes these examples are overly slanted politically, so if that's the case, my apologies. But I was thinking about, think for example about campaign strategies. 
Now, when the first, when George, when George W. Bush uh, ran for president the very first time um, in 2000, George Bush, or I guess in 1999 and 2000, George Bush attacked John McCain, and one of the ways he attacked John McCain was he put out a flyer uh, that had all these lies about John McCain, right? And the Bush campaign actually spent a whole bunch of money um, ruining John McCain's reputation. Now, and John McCain famous, if you go on YouTube, you can see it. He actually um, brings it up and attacks George W. Bush in the middle of a debate about it. He gets really sort of tense. Um, but that's an example that we might say is that the first, this campaign is one where um, the George Bush campaign did something that was not just, but was to their advantage. And in fact, they, Bush won the presidency, not McCain. And in fact, if you look at the polling, after that um, incident with the, um, the campaign flyers that were sent out about John McCain, John McCain's uh, presidential campaign in 2000 never recovered. So it looks like being unjust actually is better than being just. Um, and we can think of a whole bunch of different examples that fit like this. You can even maybe think about how your boss did something bad and it was to his advantage to do it. And we can all think of these sorts of examples. So this is a really important question that Glaucon's raising. And what Glaucon wants is he wants to hear justice praised by itself and for itself. Um, so he pro so Glaucon proposes a thought experiment. He says, let us give both the just and the unjust perfect freedom and see where they go. And this is where he's going to raise the famous example of Gaiji's ring which takes place in the text from 359D to 360B. And Gaiji's ring here is a myth, and I'm going to read it to you so we can talk about it. Um, but we're going to see when it raises this question of, wouldn't the just man and the unjust man really act the same? Imagine, for instance, if I gave you, uh, um, imagine, uh, I'm sorry, a ring that made you invisible, what would you do with that ring? Would you commit just actions or unjust actions? You can see why he, Glaucon, this is a hard challenge, because Glaucon's going to raise this issue, and Glaucon fundamentally is, is, um, is relying upon human nature, such that most of us will actually do the bad thing, right? Um, and so put another way, if we took away all of the consequences of our actions, what would you do? Would you satisfy every desire, or would you commit, or would you be just, for just reasons. So let me pull up in the text here. We'll actually take a look at it. <coughs> and Gaiji's Ring is a real mytho mythological story here. It was actually told, so it predates Plato here. Plato is using it for his own advantage, right? So here's Socrates saying, according, I'm sorry, this is Glaucon saying this. According to tradition, Gaiji's was a shepherd in the service of the king of Lydia. There was a great storm and an earthquake made an opening in the earth at the place where he was feeding his flock. Amazed at this sight, he descended into the opening where, among other marvels, he beheld a, a hollow brazen horse having doors, at which he, st he, stooping and looking in, saw a dead body of stature, a skeleton, as appeared to him more than human, and having nothing on but a gold ring. So he sees the skeleton with the gold ring, which is, and then this he took from the finger of the dead, and then reascended. Now the shepherds met together, according to custom, that they might send their monthly report about the flocks to the king. Into their assembly, he came, having the ring on his finger. And as he was sitting among them, he chanced to turn the, turn the collet of the ring into inside his hand, where he instantly became invisible to the rest of the company, and they began to speak of him as if he was no longer present. He was astonished at this. And again touching the ring, he turned the collet outwards and reappeared. He made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result. When he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible. When outwards, he reappeared. Whereupon he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court, where as soon as he arrived, he seduced the queen, and with her help conspired against the king and slew him and took the kingdom. Suppose now, Glaucon suggests, that there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one of them, and the unjust the other. No man can be a man 
it can be imagined, to be of such an iron nature that he would not that he would stand fast in justice. No, man would keep his hands off what was not his own when he could safely take it uh, while what he liked out of the market, or go into the houses and lie with one another at his pleasure, or kill or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects be like God among men. And I, I skipped a section here, as you can tell. Uh, there's something that comes right in between. And that's namely that the shepherd, later on, he actually goes on to kill the king, sleep with the, the queen, and take over the kingdom. Um, who wouldn't do that? So you can see here that the, the question that Glaucon is raising is, well, let's hypothetically imagine we have a just person. But if we, give, if we take away the consequences right, that justice seems to involve, then it doesn't look like you would really want to be just. You can see that Glaucon is challenging this, the, what we refer to here as the intrinsic value of justice, or what does it mean to say that justice is good in itself? Um, and then, but Glaucon doesn't stop there. Glaucon then, I call this the acid test for justice. I remember acid is, um, miners, for instance, in the 1800s, would use acid in order to figure out whether or not that they were looking at fool's gold or whether or not they were looking at acid gold. So you might say this is the acid test for justice, where can we figure out, can we get to the bottom, to the core of justice? And in this, we see that Glaucon then says, well, let's compare the unjust, and the, the unjust and the just. Let's imagine that the unjust man, um, the, what would be, for the unjust man, the greatest injustice would be to get away with everything, um, and yet they acquire a reputation for justice. So the unjust man, in this case, is gets everything they want. They, they have a good reputation, despite the fact that they're unjust. The just man, by contrast, is a man that's simple and well-bred, wishing not to be seen as good. But let's assume that this man, despite being good, has a reputation for the greatest injustice until death. At 362, he says, The just person will be beaten with whips, stretched on the rack, bound in change, have both eyes burnt out, and as an end, after suffering every evil, he'll be hacked in pieces. <clears throat> Whereas the unjust person rules in the city, in his city, as one who seems to be just. So, and, and so Glaucon essentially says, okay, Socrates, if justice really is better than injustice, explain to me the Gyges ring. Explain to me why it is that we always seem to default to injustice. But also explain to me why is it better to live a just life um, if you imagine the perfect, if a just person is, has an intrinsic, if justice is something intrinsic, then that means that the just person um, doesn't have to have good consequences. If they don't have to have good consequences, then why is it better to be just, right? Uh, let's take a look at the passage here, right? He says, I, I answer, let the unjust man be entirely unjust and the just man entirely just. Nothing's to be taken away from either of them and both will be perfectly furnished for the work of their respective lives. First, let the unjust be like other distinguished masters of craft, like the skillful pilot or physician who knows intuitively his own powers and keeps within their limits and who if he fails at any point is able to recover himself. So let the unjust man make his unjust attempts in the right way and lie hidden if he means to be great in his injustice, he who has found out is nobody, for the highest um, reach of injustice is to be deemed just when you're not. Therefore, I say that in the perfect, in the perfectly unjust man, we assume the most perfect injustice. There is to be no deduction, but we must allow him, while doing the most unjust acts, to have acquired the greatest reputation for justice. If we have taken a false step, he must be able to recover himself. He must be one who can speak with effect. If any of his deeds come to light, who can force his way uh, where force is required, his courage and strength and command of money and friends. So you have a, what you might say is the successfully unjust person, right? And at his side, let's place the just man in his nobleness and simplicity, wishing, as Aeschylus says, to be and not to seem good. There must, right, think about a person who's good, they're humble, right? They seem good, uh, they are good, but they don't, they don't have to act good, as it were. 
They have to put on the airs of goodness. There must be no seeming, for if he seem to be just, he will be honored and rewarded, and then we shall not know whether he is just for the sake of justice, intrinsically, not consequentially, or for the sake of honors and rewards. You can see here Socrates is comparing intrinsic and consequentialists together. Therefore, let him be clothed in justice only, having no other covering that he must ima be imagined in a state of life, the opposite of the former. Let him be the best of men, and let him be, the, be thought the worst. Then he will have been put on... To, I'm sorry, then he will be have been put to the proof, and we shall see whether he will be affected by the fear of infamy and its consequences. Let him continue thus to the hour of his death, being just and seeming to be unjust. When both have reached the uttermost extreme, the one justice and the other injustice, let judgment be given which of them is happier of the two. And you can see here, so imagine, for instance, the case that we have a perfectly just person who's, uh, who has a reputation for being unjust, wrongly, and then they're tortured to death, right? And then by contrast, let's say take the person who's really radically unjust and evil, yet they appear to be just, right? Um, so you can think of Jose, um, Jose Escobar here as a sort of example. Um, so the question is, which would life is better? Because it really looks like the unjust life is better. Now, some things to mention here is that notice the rhythm of the text. Again and again, we see a duality that's introduced and reintroduced in the text. Um, the du there's a dualism between uh, the just and the unjust. There's a dualism between the, the, what seems to be the case in both. There's always a dichotomy at stake here. Now this is what I call one of the cinematic features of the text, and I think it's actually quite critical. That is, Plato is using these constant uh, dichotomies, um, and he's doing the dichotomies rhetorically as well, uh, in order to, I think, drive his point home. Notice, of course, that Socrates makes a distinction between goods, consequentialist goods like medicine, goods for their own sake like happiness, and then goods uh, that are to be desired for their own sake intrinsically and consequentially like justice. Now if justice is better than injustice, then let's examine the, the justice and its purity. Here's the first argument. Does anyone truly desire justice for its own sake? So if you give a person this invisible ring, won't they kill, rape, steal, and do away with justice? Is justice something to be desired for its own sake or something merely um, that we do and we say we like because we're forced to do it? In other words, isn't justice just convention? Um, and then, of course, the second argument is, well, what about justice is worth desiring for its own sake exactly? And here's the thought experiment or the acid test. The perfectly unjust life. Injustice is complete, so it is unknown. The unjust man has a reputation for justice. He has commits the greatest injustices. He has um, honor, wealth, reputation, and leisure. Whereas the perfect just life, in this case, is one in which you desire justice purely intrinsically without the consequences. We've taken those consequences away. He has no honor, reputation, wealth, or leisure. So and imagine he's tortured and killed. So which life is happier? I think most of us would probably choose the unjust life. And this raises a lot of questions. And Socrates immediately suggests that... Um, it, 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 well, Socrates immediately says, Wow, Glaucon, let me see if I can find the passage in book two. He says, You've really laid down the gauntlet. Um, um, he says, This is an incredibly difficult task because it really does look like the unjust man is um, living a better life. And so Socrates then proposes a method. And this is actually quite critical to what's taking place in this first book. He suggests that if writing is too small to read, and the same words are written larger elsewhere, then you can read the larger inscription first, right? Um, it's sort of a, an odd thing to say, and when you uh, uh, read, came across this in your reading, you may have thought, what is he talking about here? Well, the idea is that and when something is too small to differentiate, if you can look at it in a bigger way, then you can understand it, right? That's what microscopes do, for instance. So he says, in this case... Justice is too difficult to isolate um, in Glaucon's example, right? That's why justice looks like, what is justice exactly here? Well, it looks something like it's intrinsically good, um, but how exactly and why? 
and it's difficult to locate. So for instance, he says, maybe we, instead of looking at the individual life, looking at the justice of the individual person, we should look at justice in a larger sense and look at justice in the city. And so Socrates devises a plan for there really is going to be the plan of the entire republic. He's going to say, let's imagine, at best we can, a city that's just. What does justice look like in the city writ large? And then perhaps we might be able to articulate where and what justice is such that it's desirable for its own sake and that it has good consequences. And so this raises the question, so this raises the thought experiment of the entire republic. Let's imagine a city that's just, and later on let's see if we can extrapolate what justice is and then answer this question. And, and it takes the entire book, I'm sorry, the entire dialogue, and it's not until the very end that we eventually get the full throated answer to why justice is better than injustice. Now, the, 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 that's sort of the introduction and the prologue to the Republic. The rest of Book 2, which is actually fairly short uh, from where we're at, then takes on this question of what is the origin of the city? Right? And the idea here is that the city, it seems like they're the very, if you're going to try to create a city, the city exists to meet the needs of its citizens, each of whom are not self-sufficient in themselves. Right? And this, is, this makes sense, right? Is the reason people live in cities is because they're not self-sufficient. None of us is our own farmer. None of this is our own soldier. None of us is our own blacksmiths, on and on and on, right? So it looks like the good city has a division of labor in it, in terms of specialization. And it'll strive for self-sufficiency and sustainability. And we see almost immediately a distinction Plato makes between what we might say is the moderate city and the city of luxury. So the moderate city is one in which everyone just simply um, comes together and works together to create the things they need to survive. Um, that means, so it's a very sort of basic bare bone city. Um, th there is a division of labor, um, you know, so the, you have a craftsman, you have, uh, you have sheep herders, right, you have um, farmers, and, and all of the, and you have fishermen, and all of these people are working together simply to create what's needed in order to survive. But it quickly comes to be the case that no one really wants to live in the moderate city, right? None of us do, um, after all, right? Why? Because the moderate city, well, the moderate city is about survival, and it's about having your needs met, but it's clear that people want more than that. People want luxury items, right? So let's imagine that we, so even though, so Socrates says, let's imagine a just city, and he imagines the moderate city, but pretty quickly, it's clear that that's not a realistic account of the city, that the city that people really want is a city of luxury, a city where people flourish. But that's going to be much, much larger because luxuries require more labor and inevitably more land to cultivate. So as a result, the luxurious city, unlike the moderate city, will actually slowly grow because it's, it, will have to, it will need more things than it's capable of sustainably having. So the luxurious city will also need an army to perhaps take land from others, right, in order to keep the luxuries going, or in order to defend itself against other cities of luxury. Now, it's interesting here the way the argument works, because on the one hand, he, said, he suggests that we want to live generally in a city of luxury, but that's going to create all these problems. Um, and even if you don't want to live in a city of luxury, the moderate city is forced to get an army simply to defend itself as well. So you can see here that even though we have a division of labor within um, Plato's um, city here, um, the division of labor can't simply be about those jobs, about certain arts. We need a guardians. We need, an, we need um, someone to protect the city. And this is where we, where we actually see in this dialogue Plato's discussion of what the origin of war is. What is the origin of war? Luxury. What is the origin of war? It's needing what is not yours or protecting yourselves from those who would like to take what is yours. So the origin of war consists in luxury, actually, which is sort of interesting. Um, and of course, one of the things that's interesting is now, for instance, think about the United States that in, in the 21st century, 
the United States is, at least as of this moment, is the largest economy. That is, we are the most wealthy society with the greatest amount of luxuries. And guess what? The United States also has the largest military um, in the world. So it looks like Plato's on to something here. Uh, so what does Plato, what does Socrates suggest? Remember, this is their thought experiment. Well, he suggests that, <coughs> excuse me, that you have to create a guardian class. And the guardian class will be different than the artisan class. The artisans um, are essentially those craftsmen like the, the, uh, the bricklayers, the bakers, the people who create things that are needed for the society, including these luxuries. But the guardians are the ones who protect. Right? But the guardians require a certain type of body and a certain sort of spirit. And this is interesting because Plato never divorces the body from the spirit, even though he makes the distinction between the body and the spirit. For him, a guardian has to have a physically well-equipped body so that they can actually protect the society. But they also need a certain sort of ethos, a certain sort of spirit. What sort of spirit should the guardian have? His answer is going to be a philosophic spirit. Right, and he mentions the idea that it looks like dogs are philosophic animals, right? They have to have the same spirit as a watchdog, as a protector. So Socrates suggests that the guardians have to be philosophical as well. He says, compare dogs. He says, for instance, do dogs bark at those they do not know? Yes. So dogs bark in the face of ignorance. Do dogs like that which they know and understand? Yes. Right? When dogs... Um, recognize their owner or they recognize a friend they're gentle and kind in the same way a philosopher um, likes that likes knowledge so dogs hate that which they're ignorant of and so in the same sense learning and education is an essential ingredient for the city and especially for the guardians because the guardians in order to be successful have to know what is and is not a threat to the society. That is, the guardian has to have knowledge, right? So for the guardians, because the guardians have to, they need to discern threat from non-threats to the city, and so that means education is a primary element um, of, oops, sorry, is a primary element of the dialogue. I'm actually going to conclude my review of books one and book two here and for those of you who've been reading it you'll know that that's insufficient there's a lot more that gets said uh, but it is we've already been talking for over an hour so it's time to end um, so but we're going to see here at the end here is that the guardians are the is the in, you you need someone to protect the city so how does this relate to justice we'll see later that Plato argues that justice is a virtue and that part of its virtue um, consists in having this philosophical spirit and ultimately in terms of having education. So this is a general introduction to books one and two of Plato's Republic. Thank you for watching um, and I look forward to seeing you guys online next time as we explore the other passages of the Republic. Thanks a lot. See you online. Bye.